Hello, welcome. Oh my goodness. Welcome to Hug Nation. Welcome to the Belief Buffet. My name is Halcyon and I am back from Burning Man 2022. This was my hardest burn ever. I am currently decompressing from Burning Man as well as quarantining from COVID. I tested positive on Wednesday of last week, something like that. Unsure when I got sick, if I got sick on Playa or if I got sick in Reno. Um, I actually feel great right now. Excited to share with you. Um, I'm still processing so much. So I'm going to share a few highlights, reflections, as well as some just basic um, where I'm at and where I've been. This was the hardest burn I've ever had. This was my 24th visit to Black Rock Desert, my 23rd Black Rock City visit and burn in the desert there. Uh, it kicked my ass. It broke me. I said out loud, I can't do this again. And... I have been having a more and more difficult time with heat as I've gotten older, and this was a hot year. I just could not get my body temperature down. I would be drinking ice water. I had frozen Gatorade bottles under my armpits. I had a, a gel thing on my neck. And I'm, I generally am so daytime focused in my activities and stuff, but it just, it was tough. And then it, it, the, the sun would go down and it wouldn't cool off. I just could not get my body temperature down. And, and then after pushing and just trying to make the most of things and having very few excursions out of camp because I just couldn't, it was so draining to get out into the, the heat of the day, I did my Thursday activities and did the, the pink ride. And then Thursday about sunset, I just hit a wall. And I got floored and hung out in my RV. I had a little section of my RV being air conditioned. So in the heat of the day, I could keep that area down to like 90 degrees. At night, I could get it down to a, a reasonable, you know, mid seventies, 80 degrees to, so I could sleep. But um, in the daytime, I could get it down to barely survivable, but at least with the air conditioning blowing on me, I could just sit there and I was stuck there for about 36 hours. Um, I couldn't barely move. I, I was so weak that I actually made a note and I pulled it out on the camp kitchen and I said, check on Halcyon every hour and with check boxes because I was genuinely scared that if I got any worse and people thought I was sleeping or like, ah, Halcyon's got this. He's just, you know, he's, he's, he's a vet. He's got, you know, and people just, assumed I was okay and I got worse, I would be unable to yell for help. I was legitimately scared that I could die. Uh, and so thankfully campmates like Cookie and Amy, they checked on me every hour and they brought me things to drink. And when I finally was like, I was constipated and then Amy brought me prunes and then I had like, I had to go, but there's no way I could make it to the porta potty. I had them bring me my bucket. And so I hovered over my bucket and uh, sharded hourly for a day. And um, it was rough. Eventually, people in my camp uh, and former campmates and rangers demanded that I go to medical. And so I went to medical and uh, they gave me more hydration. Um, actually an interesting experience there. Like they didn't take my vitals. They, uh, but I guess they looked at me and they looked at my fingers and they assured me that I wasn't going to die. And so I eventually drank a bunch and then headed back to camp. And within, you know, 24 hours, I was 
uh, able to move around. I still was extremely weak and was unable to participate at the level that I would like. In fact, I had a period after that where during our strike period, where we ended up starting strike 12 hours early in the middle of the night at midnight because it was so hot we, need, we knew we had to start at night. Um, thank you, Jesse, our strike lead, for taking that on and making that work. Um, but I, I could not move, and I felt I was in such a dark place. I, I was convinced that I needed to step down from Pink Heart, that I did not deserve to be in the camp. I did not deserve to lead it. I was a, I was, I was a hypocrite. I told everyone to take care of yourself so that you could be there for a strike, and then I was out. Now, looking back, it's possible that I had COVID at that time. I did take a test on Friday when I was in the depth of my woes, and it came out negative, but you know, I'm told that these home tests are not always super accurate, so who knows? Possibly I was sick then. I'm still testing positive, but I'm over the the, the symptoms. I don't know. Maybe I just had, there was another virus that was going around. Maybe I was simply heat exhaustion. I don't know, but it was, it was the darkest, weakest I've ever felt at Burning Man. It broke me. So that's the negative. And in fact, it was so negative that after the burn, when I got to Reno, I couldn't think of anything else. People said, how was your burn? And all I could think about was that dark chapter. It was almost like I had a traumatic experience. And it's actually given me some empathy and sympathy towards people that have had you know, trauma. I'm not saying, I'm, it's, I'm just saying, like I'm, I, I was able to witness my brain's inability to overcome it. And since then, the week since then, I have been really actively practicing remembering the good things and going through the gifts that I've been given and looking at pictures and listening to stories and, and, and really having to actively pursue the cone because the crap has been so... Mm. So thankfully, I am, I'm moving through it and I am starting to see more and more of the blessings and the gifts and the beautiful things and the wonderful things that happened before I got floored. And so I want to share some of the, the cool experiences. One was that I got to do uh, an interview on BMIR with Jax. Uh, we talked for like an hour and a half and it was such a safe place and we had such a kind of a cool heart connection that I really felt it was, it put me in this channeling of so much beautiful thoughts and I felt really connected to the whole community because BMRR is kind of like this, you know, voice and, and communication chakra of our city. And so it felt really cool to, to be trusted in that place. I can't wait to hear the archive of that. And that put me into a, a really beautiful headspace what day was that? Monday? Tuesday? But that put me into a good headspace in the next few days, even as I was suffering from the heat. Um, and then my favorite art piece, and I, I saw so little art because it was so difficult to go on adventures. And, you know, whether it was a dust storm that kept me in or the heat, I, I didn't leave camp nearly as much as normal. I didn't see nearly as much as normal. And normally I miss so much, so I missed almost everything. But one piece that I saw many times, at least four times, I came, approached it or I sought it out because the first time I saw it, it floored me. It was called Facing the Fear Beast uh, by the artist Tigre Marshall Lively. And it was this massive, like, boar-like, anime beast with big fangs and it was made out of tires and it had this demony things on it and and then in the throat of this beast was this plastic child and then facing down the beast was the same child in metal and as you approach the piece you hear this haunting soundscape of like you can't do it you're not enough you'll never be anything and it's like whoa and when I approached it, there were a lot of people just looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. 
And luckily, somebody explained the piece to me because when you walked up to it, it had a plate. And so when you walked up next to the boy and stood right next to him or held him or hugged the boy, the boy in its throat lit up and the soundscape changed with like chimes. I was like, you can do it. You're enough. You're beautiful. We can do this. And the first time that, that I heard that change, like <gasps> I just started bawling. It was so powerful. And so the next day, I went out at sunrise because I wanted to take some pictures of it. And as I approached it, there was a photographer on the ground looking up into, through the metal child into the mouth. And I, I walked up, walked up, straight up to the boy, stood next to it, and I hugged it. And as I hugged it, it lit up. And the photographer's like, move, move, move. I've been waiting for it to light up. Move. I've been waiting to get this picture. Can you please move? I'm trying to take a picture of it lighting up. I've been waiting. It only does it every once in a while. And I'm holding the boy or the child. I'm holding the child. And I look over to the photographer. I say, my experience with the art trumps your photograph. I said, and the way this piece works is that it lights up when there's human contact. And he's like, I go, would you take a picture of me next to my favorite piece of art? He's like, totally, yes, yes, yes. And then after I gave him my cards, we'd be in touch. He goes, Halcyon, oh, oh, you, you, uh, I, I, uh, you, you, uh, you do journalism for Burning Man. Yes, okay, cool. And so it was, it was, uh, I felt like it was a teaching moment. It was a compassion moment. But I think it's also, it's something that I don't think is educated enough. I talked to another friend who was kind of shamed away from the piece because there was a photo shoot going on with a naked woman in the mouth and they were kind of shooing people away and, and afterwards they felt like I, they were like, I'm upset at myself for not kind of being stronger. And I think that as a community, we need to be very clear that Priority one is we get to experience the art. And if you as a photographer want to take a picture of the art, you're taking a picture of the experience, which includes people participating in it. If you happen to get a picture by itself, great. If you want to wait until there's no one there, that's your prerogative. But you are not allowed to pressure anyone away from the art so that you can get your picture. Not cool. So thank you, Tigre. That was such an incredible piece. You know, as the piece, the weather hit and more and more, it, it, it became less and less functioning in the way that it did originally. But originally, oh my God, it was incredible. Which is cool now as I've seen so many people talk about it because it was one of the few things I saw and I could say, it's my favorite piece. Although that's hard to say because I, I've seen so few, but I'm glad that the one that hit me so hard, many people are saying was their favorite piece too. Another highlight for me this year was I took on an art project. Um, Pink Heart has this beautiful fur signage in our frontage. And over the years, we've tried different ways of lighting it. And really what I've always really wanted was to outline the letters, but that is so labor intensive. And it's hard to find the right product because like normal LED strips, they shine outward. And so they don't bend in the right way. And so leading up to the burn, I had bought some products and some LED rope lights and some LED different things. And I found something that I thought would work and decided that I was going to wrap this thing. And so I, I got help online with people that helped me do the math of how much t would I need because it's way more complicated and a lot more than you would think. And then um, re didn't have time to do it before the burn. So I brought all the materials and talked to the, the, our build lead, Carpo. I said, are you cool with me working on this during build? And he said, yeah, totally. And so I spent two full days of build screwing in these little connectors that I had found a, what, that would work, that I could zip tie. I, 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 I drilled the connector in and then was able to zip tie the tape, the, the LED thing. and. I was, come on, it's going to work, it's going to work, it's going to work. It was so much 
labor. And then the first time it lit up, it was so rewarding. It was so exciting. And then all week long, our frontage looked incredible. We also did some new things that we would not have done had we not been given this new location on this corner without the esplanade. So we, we moved our big archway in right underneath our letters. So it, it just became this boom frontage that was the best it's ever looked. So that was a happy result of a location that was not my first choice. People keep asking, what'd you think about the new location? I'm like, I'm still thinking about it. There was lessons and there was things that I uh, missed about the Esplanade. There's certainly an aspect of the Pink Heart gift that is more powerful and impactful and works more with our design when people can come in from the open playa through a dust storm and we can present them with water hydration and our signage and our beacon can steer them in from the, from the open playa. But that isn't to say that there wasn't all sorts of incredible ways that we were able to gift in the location we were given. And I will leave it at that. Um, so the sign was so rewarding to, to like really feel like I, I, I made something which is not always in my wheelhouse. But what is in my, in my wheelhouse is, you know, being a part of camp leadership. And by far, the most incredible part of this year for me was witnessing our camp dynamics. It was hard for everyone. And so it required more inter-camp compassion and taking care of each other. And the degree of of love that I saw from campmates and you know the f feeding one another and taking care of one another and decorating our private spaces so that they looked like just I mean our our private eating area and hangout area was as gorgeous as you know 90% of of camp's frontage uh, not to brag, but it's there's something about that piece of of this theme camp magic that when in the private area as a family you you fill each other up so full that then you are able to be ambassadors of that love to the city and I don't think you have the the passion, the power, the energy to do so if you don't fill your cups first. And so we did such a good job of that this year. So many people put in so much energy and effort in so many ways. So I'm, I was so proud of what we created collectively, what we, how we showed up collectively. It was, uh, it was magic. And as always, I think one of the most powerful and rewarding things for me was getting to meet burners who got to share with me a story of their journey, uh, often telling me about you know their life previous to Burning Man, their discovery of Burning Man, maybe they're watching a video two of mine, how it prepared them as best as one can, and then having this play experience transform them. And I got to tell you that I needed to hear that. There's, there's been a lot of things lately and a lot of things at this burn and a lot of things in the world that have hammered my faith a bit. And so to get reminded that this place, that this community can still change lives and in changing lives potentially change the world, it matters. And to be totally honest, do I feel like the ratio of awesome to mm, 
is not as good as it once was in our beautiful city? I do. I think that uh, aspects of the magic and the purity have been corroded, but not so badly that, that the magic doesn't come through and the transformation doesn't happen. Not so badly that it's not worth it. He says, as he almost goes, oh my God, does that mean I have to go back next year? <gasps> I am holding those decisions for another few weeks. I can't imagine enduring that heat again. Uh, but I will definitely see you at some regionals. Planning on being in Utopia, the San Diego regional burn coming up in October. And plan on being in Love Burn. Who knows what other regionals. Maybe you've got a good one that you want to convince me is where I should head. Hopefully a cooler one. Mm, my goodness. So I am slowly getting my bearings. I am still COVID positive. I am decompressing. I am slowly getting momentum going in my integration group. So if you want to join that and share your experiences on Playa and support one another as we start to integrate this into the world, you can go to decom.hugnation.com and join that Facebook group. It's free. It is, it is a, a chance for us to not let the magic fade too much, to honor our responsibilities as ones who have witnessed something so so incredible, I think we have a responsibility to, to have the courage and the strength to keep it going. So I am trying to summon that strength while I am patient, while I am healing, while I am processing. And I look forward to sharing that journey with you. If I got to meet you on Playa, oh, what a treat and thank you. If I didn't get to meet you, man, it was hard to get out and about. And I mean, probably the thing that it was the most difficult for me was normally I spend so much time in our frontage at Pink Heart, just out hosting and meeting people. And I had 48 hours where I could not stand and I missed the, the prime meeting people hours. And I really had to let go of my expectations. And, and, and survive. You know, they say it's, you don't get the burn that you want. Well, still not convinced that was the burn I needed, but if it was, man, it had a heavy cost. Whew. So, thank you. I'll see you at home.